In a normal bow, one's arm simply pulls back the string. But in a double bow, the string must slide over the first bow to pull that back. The friction at this joint could easily make the expensive addition of a second bow hardly worth the effort. As the string slides over the arm of the second bow, it rubs against the wood. This again uses up valuable power that is not being utilized to project the arrow to its target. Right, well that drawer is about 11 or 12 inches. The single bow shot goes 40 feet. Okay, that's the first one, so. All right. What we've got here is two bows, and they're bending in opposite directions to give us a double effect. Can we square now? That's about centred now, yeah. but um, as you can see, we can actually feel the jerking, so we yeah, really are can, actually you can getting see it right on these right on these ends. I think we better pull this together because those reliefs show two men pulling. The archaeological evidence confirms that the extra power would have required two soldiers to draw the bow. Right. Okay. If you'd like to find that. Yeah. Why Sorry. Not. This is the double bow. Let's see how much further it goes. I think we'd better place that out, Richard. Yes, that it looks significantly better, doesn't it? It does. The arrow from the double bow travels 65 feet. We're looking at at least a 50% increase. Right. So what we've got here is a machine that gives us 50% more power with yeah. no extra width. That's right. Even with the energy lost at the friction point, the double bow has 50% more range than the single bow. A militarily effective improvement, this extra power also gave it another advantage. The only problem we've got, of course, is in a jungle, you're going to lose performance because you're firing through trees, you're firing through leaves. So what we really need to do, I think, is to look at just how well this works in a jungle situation. The dense foliage that the Khmer and Champa were fighting in produced obstacles between the weapon and the target, barriers that could slow down the arrow and render it less effective. To recreate these conditions, Richard and Andrew have set up a series of targets three feet apart, an approximation of the gap between leaves and branches in a Southeast Asian jungle. Real leaves and branches are of varying thicknesses, but Richard and Andrew are using thick paper for the test because it has a uniform thickness. In this way, they can collect accurate scientific and measurable comparative data about the arrow's penetration. That was fantastic, the ripples we went through. That was brilliant. We've just gone through all seven of them, straight through and out the other side with almost no loss of power. So as a jungle fighting weapon, this really does work. It's going to cut through leaves. It's going to hit the target at the other end. So good idea. To everyone's surprise, the boat flies through every layer with insignificant loss of power. The tests have revealed why the double bow was so effective in the jungle. It achieved 50% more power and range than a single bow, without any addition to its length. It was silent. It could punch through leaves, and it could send its deadly arrow into a distant enemy target in a similar way to modern elite snipers operating in jungles today. With the new Chinese technology, the Champers gained a tactical advantage. They fought all the way into the Khmer capital and killed their king. But the mystery deepens. In spite of this elite weapon, we know the Khmer Empire defeated the Champa uprisings and thrived for another 200 years. Did the double bow have a beatable weakness, a mechanical flaw? The Khmer are one of the more intangible, tantalizing mysteries of history. This is a people who haven't left us any great written record. They've left us visuals, they've left us some enormous temple buildings with elaborate carved images on. These ancient temple reliefs at Angkor Tom depict the Khmer and Champa forces going into battle. They hold the secret. And on those temple stelae, we see some very interesting things. They changed their weapons technology during the building of the temples, during the war. And one of the things they introduce is a double bow. This suggests that the Khmer beat the Champa with their own weapon. What we know is that the Chinese sent this technology to the Champa. But Champa deserters carried it to the Khmer. And the Khmer then made a point of celebrating this technology on their temple walls and celebrating the fact that it was Champa deserters who'd brought it over. 
the Khmer obtained enemy technology and turned it against the Champa, and so saved their empire. A short distance across the ocean from Cambodia lies the island nation of Japan. In the 13th century AD, Japanese military engineers also used an amazing piece of weapons technology to save their nation from annihilation. A weapon that is still famous today for being the sharpest and most deadly blade ever made. The fabled samurai sword. Even with all the technology that we have and all the machinery, we cannot make a sword like it was made many centuries ago. The sword was made with ingenuity and incredible craftsmanship. In 1281, the great Mongol leader, Kublai Khan, sent a force from China of 4,000 ships and 200,000 men to invade Japan. The largest fleets ever put together in the medieval world were those that Kublai Khan produced for his invasions of Japan in 1274 and 1281. This was probably the largest naval flotilla ever assembled prior to D-Day. The Mongol raids into Japan in the 13th century are chronicled on a set of manuscripts known as the Mokoshurai Ekotoba. Before this campaign, typical Japanese battles were fought between individual champions and generals. But the Mongols were a tribal equestrian people, and they attacked in mass groups. Up until this point, simple Japanese swords had been made of a single piece of iron hammered into a sharp blade. There was a trade-off between hard and sharp blades made of steel that could cut through Mongol armor but broke easily, and softer, more flexible blades made of iron. Although the iron blades did not break as often, they could not penetrate the stiff, lacquered leather protection worn by the Mongols. The Japanese desperately needed a new technology, a special weapon that would complement the samurai reputation of being an elite special force the nation stood on the brink of disaster. And that was about the time when the first true swordsmith found a way to make a sword that could be very strong to cut through, but soft and flexible and fast at the same time. Um, and that person was called Masamune. Masamune created the hardest, toughest and sharpest swords the world has ever seen. Fei is one of the highest-ranking female martial artists and swordswomen in the world. She is an advanced practitioner of Aido, the art of drawing the sword, and Tamashigiri, the art of cutting with it. But how did the great swordsmith Masamune manage to create such a deadly weapon? His genius was in combining the properties of hard and sharp with tough and flexible. The fabulous thing about Japanese swords is that the way in which they combine iron and steel together. Um, the steel is important because it's the hardable component. You can get a great deal of hardness on that edge, but if you harden too much, then the sword will become brittle. What was Masamune's secret? How did he combine these metals to create the greatest sword the world has ever known? David Starley of the Royal Armouries in Leeds has been examining a cross-section of an ancient samurai sword under the microscope. The cross-sections we've looked at, we've seen a piece of steel that's been wrapped around the outside and just hardened purely on the cutting edge. The sword has clearly been quenched very effectively to give hardnesses equivalent to a modern razor. The iron is impossible to over-harden, therefore the blade remains tough as well as having the hard cutting edge. The secret was in the tempering, heating a metal and then cooling it. Tempering defines whether ferrous metal becomes iron or steel. Blades were covered with a lost secret formula of clays and charcoals of differing thicknesses, thinner at the sharp end and thicker at the spine. The clay coating acted as an insulator so that the heating and cooling rate changed along the length of the blade. By doing this and hammering out any air bubbles that could weaken the metal, swordsmiths could actually create the two different metals with their different properties in the same blade. 
It was this stroke of genius that created the incredible samurai sword. The elite special weapon that allowed the samurai to repel the Mongol invaders. The sword would go on to define their status as an elite force for the next 300 years and became the most legendary and deadly sword in the history of warfare. But the secrets of some ancient weapons can remain a mystery, even today. In ancient Rome, there's evidence that the army used dogs in war. But what was their training and how were they deployed? Ancient Discoveries is investigating the secrets of how elite Roman units might have unleashed their dogs of war. From the war elephant tanks of Southeast Asia, to the heavily armored troops charging on horseback across the medieval battlefield, all armies across history have employed animals in war. But a mystery endures about the ancient wartime use of the most popular domestic animal in the world, the dog. The canine tooth of a fully grown mastiff can reach up to two inches long. It's one of the oldest breeds of dog in the world, weighing up to 60 pounds. This makes such a dog an ideal special forces weapon. In 1513, Henry VIII of England made a presentation of 400 mastiffs to Philip, the King of Spain. And we know that Philip, the King of Spain, used those mastiffs en masse. Can you imagine a pack of 400 snarling mastiffs going at the enemy? He used them at the Battle of Valencia, and they drove the French mastiffs from the field. So we've got two armies using mastiffs. Extraordinary. But what of the Roman dog units? One of the most frustrating things about trying to look at dogs in the Roman military is the Romans just haven't written enough down for us. And the Romans, they write everything down. We know so many details about life in the Roman army, but not much about how they use dogs. We know they did use dogs, there's reference to dogs, and there are certainly images of dogs, and there are images of dogs in battle, but they don't tell us how. But on the column of Marcus Aurelius in Rome, there are clues as to how the Romans used military dogs. Marcus Aurelius was one of Rome's greatest emperors. He won several military campaigns against the barbarian tribes on Rome's northern borders, but was also a great philosopher whose writings are still studied today. He ruled between 161 and 180 AD. The column was commissioned to celebrate his achievements. There is one scene from the Marcus Aurelius column of this, you know, emperor, which shows two dogs together um, near military figures, including the emperor and so on. According to 17th century accounts describing the column, it illustrated an extraordinary tactic used in battle by Roman dog units. The dogs would be unleashed, and just as they arrived at the front rank of the enemy, Roman archers would let fly their arrows. It's a controversial theory. So that as the enemy lifted their shields to defend themselves against the arrow storm, then the dogs would come in and seize their legs. I don't think I've ever heard such implausible, ridiculous nonsense in my life. It, it just doesn't begin to be a possibility. The risk of your own dog being hit by the arrow storm if it was just a few feet short, it, 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 you know, it doesn't begin to make sense.